Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. I need to take a week off. I have an opportunity to be an extra on this TV show that they film in a dome outside of Los Angeles. So I hope you'll enjoy this remastered version of Mark Sargent's Flat Earth Clues Episode 4, The Truman Show. I was, and still am, a huge conspiracy guy. I literally ran out of new tin hat topics to research, and I still wouldn't look at this one without embarrassment. But every time I glanced at it, there was something unresolved. Well, hi everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today we're going to have a look at Flat Earth Clues Part 4 by Mark Sargent. In this episode, Mark explains that the world is a terrarium, with the authority as the puppet master. Flat Earth Clues Part 4 Shell Beach. This is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the flat earth system we live in and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. This clue covers the near perfect design of the flat earth model and will break down some of the logic behind the decisions made. It sounds like a big task, and it is, but to start, let's look at something small like this little guy. Now Mark is starting this off trying to lay some groundwork for a later concept that we are simply mice in a terrarium toiling away at our lives for the benefit of some authority. So the mouse goes into the box for the first time and the reaction is always the same. It explores its surroundings and more importantly tests the barrier around it probing for exits or potential exits. The mouse inspects every inch of its new glass home and at some point, settles into the acceptance that the walls are indeed solid, and that it may be there for a while. Every so often, it will repeat the process, again checking the boundaries of the cage, just in case something has changed. What it doesn't do is act like it would in the wild, because it realizes that it's in a form of captivity. The glass box doesn't even remotely resemble its natural environment. You could put this box in the middle of a forest, and the mouse may feel slightly better about its situation, but it still knows that it's been trapped against its will, and will settle into a non-native lifestyle. Take the same animal, and now put it into the middle of a hundred-mile-square wildlife preserve, surrounded on all sides by a similar type of glass enclosure. The creature doesn't even bother to rush the size of the preserve and start testing the boundaries, mostly because it's out of visual range. It could be days or even weeks before it even encounters a single fence. The animal's routine is spent doing what it normally would do. It eats, it sleeps, it breeds. It does everything that it would naturally do in the wild. If one day the animal approaches the fence, there might be some curiosity. But any anxiety is quickly resolved by just turning around and heading back into the vast expanse from which it came. The point here is that all creatures great and small inside a giant wildlife preserve when encountering the fence wouldn't care. They would all in their own way just shrug and move on with their lives. However, if you take a human, male or female, regardless of education or nurturing, and put them in the exact same wildlife sanctuary, the response would be quite different. When the human approaches the glass fence, they don't see it as a minor distraction. They pause. They wonder, and more importantly, they ask questions, either internally or amongst others. Why is the fence here? How far does it reach? Can I dig underneath, or climb over, or go around it? These questions continue in a way you might imagine, but eventually, a bigger question jumps to the top of the list. Who built the fence? You know, perhaps it's my personality type, or the fact that I'm an optimist, that I don't look at barriers with fear. I look at barriers as a challenge to overcome, and I think many other people see them the same way. You know, another thought is to have a look at this corn plant right here. Now, an animal will look at it and see a plant. As a person, I'll look at it and say, cool, that's a living thing. Then I'll start asking questions. Why is it green? What makes it grow? Can I use it in some way? Then, quite frankly, if corn plants are my thing, I could spend an entire lifetime learning about the micro root system or the cellular structure of the leaves. In short, I could strive to understand the natural world and the biology of this particular corn plant. My colleague in the lab across the hall will do the same with potatoes. Adding more humans to the equation increases the disparity of the situation by orders of magnitude. 
Have you seen the fens? Do you know how long it's been here? Have you ever known anyone that's been outside it? It's older than us. Who is responsible for the fence? What can we do to appease the group that created it? You can see what this might lead to. Well, yes, I can see how this could lead to a belief in a higher being and a desire to understand by having that faith in a higher being. A sense of faith gives many people a comfort in life and a sense of purpose, and I don't have a problem with that, not one bit. For others, it leads us to places like this. This is my alma mater, Michigan State University, where I studied natural sciences. Both faith and education address the question that Mark raises a desire to know more about the world around us and to have an answer to the question of why they're not mutually incompatible. A long-lasting group hysteria would entrench itself within the population, grab hold and never let go. The fence is bigger, older, and wiser than they are. It humbles them, it angers them, and it is forever. It is their proof of a higher power. Maybe not God, but certainly God-like. No civilization, regardless of technology, discipline, or age, would be able to cope with the existence of it. No, Mark, I'm going to have to disagree with you on that. I think that when humans are presented with challenges, we rise to the challenge. We have a desire innate within our bodies and our souls to expand our horizons, to explore the unknown. To put this in terms that you might understand better, we wish to boldly go where no man has gone before. To summarize... A garden variety wildlife preserve would work for 99.99% of all the world's life forms. For human beings, however, you would need to make some modifications, or really just one big one. So let's take a look at a few examples of how this could be accomplished, and from there expand it. The first failed example can be seen in the 1998 movie Dark City. This is a good starting point to get you in the right mindset. The premise here is that an advanced race creates a small flat earth area, complete with a traditional dome. The design, however, is initially flawed in that they built the city all the way to the outer edge, leaving no room for error. To compensate for this, they altered the memories of the human population on a regular basis, therefore repressing any long-term investigations. However, in movies, there are always anomalies, like the police officer who realizes that even though he remembers visiting a place called Shell Beach, there is no way to reach it, because Shell Beach is outside of the flat world and never existed. He just keeps going around the circular city that has no exits. In the end, another man, the hero of the movie, makes it to the edge, steals the advanced race's power, and creates an ocean which really should have been there in the first place. Now, I find Mark rather insightful here. He identifies the main problem with this terrarium analogy that he makes. If humans know that there is a barrier, they will seek to overcome it. So the only way to keep them in a terrarium is do not allow them to know that there is a barrier. He's going to develop this further in his favorite analogy of The Truman Show. Move from there to a movie released only four months later called The Truman Show. The movie is interesting on several levels, including construction. Using their existing model of a small town, bordered on one side by a large lagoon and wilderness, and the other a seemingly expansive ocean, it was less than 20 miles across, and even though Truman's desire to explore was repressed, there was still a chance that he would venture to the outer edge, which is where the movie ended. But for the most part, it worked. Truman believed the entire scenario because he was born into it, and then lived 30 plus years without any reason to doubt where he was, which could be said for any of us. This is one of my favorite clips from the movie. You know, it could happen to you. This shows that there was an active effort to suppress inquiry about the outside world or the world beyond the bridge from your little town. The reason for that, of course, was that the town itself was an illusion in a contained system like a terrarium. You know, once again, I think Mark's next point is interesting as well. What if this was all put into action by another being, and the descendants of the original inhabitants simply weren't aware that there was anything different? Mark is actually making a very good point for a very silly argument, but a good point nonetheless. A fictional situation just like that was made into the 2004 movie, The Village. And even though it turned into one of those M. Night Shyamalan plot twist things, the premise was very feasible. 
a wealthy group of idealists buy a large parcel of land in an existing wildlife preserve, create a small town from the 1800s, and raise children there. They pay off government officials to keep planes far away and spread a myth that monsters live in the forest. As far as the kids are concerned, they actually are living in a small Pennsylvania town in the 1800s. And being born into it, why wouldn't they? If the story continued, eventually the elders that founded the town would all pass away, leaving the children to pass on the legacy, free from any burden of guilt that their world was not what it appeared to be. In fact, the larger you make the enclosed world, the less micromanaging needs to be done. It gets easier as it scales up. You place in gradual negative reinforcement, one that creates an illusion of choice. Look at the flat earth map again. Continents grouped in the center, surrounded in all directions by hundreds of miles of salt water. As you move closer to the edge, the temperature starts taking a nosedive. Then you start seeing icebergs. If that doesn't stop you, then you run into what we call Antarctica, which is a steep climb two miles up with no plant life or indigenous livestock animals. And if you had the wherewithal to make it that far, you would still have hundreds of miles of endless ice and snow. It's easy to see why so few people have gone the distance. It's a lucid, intelligent, well-thought-out objection. Thank you, Your Honor. Overruled. Well, so few people may have gone to the South Pole, but the bottom line is people have gone to the South Pole. In the last 70 years, people... Thousands of people have lived and worked and done research in Antarctica. In fact, you're more than welcome to go there as a tourist. Tickets are $51,250. How many would you like? Recall, I did say you could go. I didn't say that it would be cheap or that you could get there on your good looks and burning desire to do your own research. Compare this to the upper ceiling, which is much easier to maintain. You simply decrease the oxygen rates so that every thousand feet up, it gets more difficult to breathe. This slows down exploration over mountain ranges and discourages limited control flight, such as balloons. Also keep in mind that the dome itself doesn't have to be that high in relation to the outer ring. Well, Mark, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disagree with you on that one. I actually put out a video a little while ago on a scientifically designed flat earth model and map. In that video, I did demonstrate that a dome around the earth in order to fit with all other observations, would have to be spherical and encompass the entire flat Earth. This mandates that the dome has to be as high as it is wide. With commercial aircraft capping out at 10 miles and rockets less than 400, the dome would actually look more like a stadium roof, depending on how you wanted to display things like the sun, moon, and stars. An enclosed world with these type of safeguards would be able to sustain an unknowing population for, say, what, 4,500 years? Then you could artificially introduce a globe model into the scientific community before the civilization technology reaches a point that could lead to discovery. And 500 years later, here we are. Mark, do you recall your friend Al Biruni from the last video? Persian scientists from a thousand years ago that first proposed your beloved AE map? Well, from exactly the same article that you looked at, here is his method of determining the circumference and the radius of the Earth. A main problem of you and the Flat Earth movement in general is that you seem to believe that these numbers were just made up out of whole cloth. That simply is not the case. These are measured values. They are what they are. A civilization inside an amazing structure doing what we would naturally do, while the authority stands by the gate and fears the consequences if we ever found out for ourselves. Well, I'm going to close this up by agreeing with Mark Sargent. We as humans do live in a terrarium. It is our planet Earth. We are hemmed in not by a dome, but by our atmosphere and the limitations of our physiology. We are a resourceful 
and reasoning species, capable of great advancements in science and technology. The vision of man that Mark would have you believe is that we are lab mice in a terrarium under the control of a researcher somewhere. My vision of mankind is that of Richard Byrd and George Mallory. We are a species that constantly strives to go beyond the next mountain. The first vision of flat earth is very comforting if you are not adventurous or don't wish to expand your horizons. Science looks at the world in wonderment and sees the endless possibilities, where the only expectation is that we have hope that we will know more tomorrow than we know today. This is Bob the Science Guy, signing out from Northern Michigan. Hey guys, take a moment, hit that little like and subscribe button down there. These videos are getting thousands of views and hundreds of likes. Let's see if we can bring those numbers a little closer to the number of views. All right, we'll see you again soon.